Good afternoon. In 1991, the world was introduced to my family. My father, Fred Phelps, took his small church and they congregated at the corner of Gage Boulevard and 10th Street in Topeka, Kansas with their handmade signs declaring their God's hatred of gays. Several years later, when Matthew Shepard was killed in Laramie, Wyoming, they showed up there with their now iconic signs that were flashed around the world by television signal. God hates fags. They continued their campaign. Over the years, attending the funerals of high-profile gays. But as the 20th century came to a close, the media had lost interest and the world had calloused to their uh, morbid images. And then 9-11 happened and the seemingly inevitable war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And my father's campaign gained new life as they hit upon the idea that they would tie the death of American soldiers to their condemnation of the LGBT community. So they soon showed up at the funerals of American soldiers, and once again the world took notice. This place where these ideas were born was my home. This is where I developed my ideas of the world and where I was taught my morality. I had a front row seat as my father used the words of a book to justify his violence towards his wife and children, to justify bigotry and homophobia and hatred of others in the name of a God. And because of this, on the night of eight, uh, November 22nd, 1976, actually at midnight, the moment I became a legal adult, I left the Westboro Baptist Church. <laughs> After 18 years of living with my parents and my 12 siblings, 18 years of physical and emotional, emotional abuse, and 18 years of a Calvinist theology. I left all that I knew because of all that I knew. And I left with the slightest guttering flame of hope that there might be another truth out there. Of all these images, the most troubling for me is the images of the young children. Because they're caught up in this place that they have no control over and they gain a skewed perspective of the world that is with them for a lifetime. And even those that manage to leave spend way too much of their resources trying to make sense of the world that they live in rather than thriving in it and contributing to it. I know this because I lived it. I spent many years dealing with fear and guilt and self-doubt as I struggled with the God that was hardwired into my brain. Even as I searched for the God of the kinder, gentler uh, modern society, the shadow of that malevolent deity continued to infringe upon my thoughts. But eventually, it was my rebellious nature and my tendency towards skepticism that led me to some new ideas that I would like to share with you tonight. First of all, I realized that if I was going to discover truth, nothing could be sacred. There could be no unassailable ideas. Then I learned to peel back the layers of the assumptions that, that uh, put ideas on the pedestal of truth. And in that process, I discovered that many of my ideas rested on the single assumption that a book was holy simply because it said it was. And I realized if that assumption fell, that many others would fall, as well as the beliefs that were sustained by them. In that process, 
not long ago, I came across one of a passage from uh, my father's holy book. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, there's this. Now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three. And the greatest of these is love. Three human characteristics vaunted above all others. Cherished. So I want to challenge that idea. First of all, there's hope. Hope seems to me to be a rather benign condition because it, it actually doesn't promote action as much as wait with bated breath for an outcome once action is taken. But what of faith? Faith is defined as belief not sustained by logical proof or material evidence. To challenge that idea, I'd like to tell you a story. Lisa Frost was a young woman who grew up in our community, went to school with my oldest daughter. She had recently graduated from Boston University and had planned to come home, spend some time with her family before she went to the Bay Area to start her new career. As chance would have it, Lisa had been booked on the second plane that flew into the World Trade Center. America had been attacked. Nearly 3,000 lives were lost, and every human in America was impacted profoundly by it. Nineteen hijackers had flown four planes into buildings of the ground, and likely one of the last thoughts on their mind was of the reward they would receive for their actions. The only certainty that they had that they would receive this reward was a certainty based on faith, a certainty that was not based on logical proof or material evidence. So I reached out to Lisa's family, worked with, his, with her father as he prepared for her memorial service, and I had several opportunities to talk to him. And through the tears, I watched him as he struggled to make sense of this senseless loss. And I watched my family, and I watched my friends in the community. And somewhere in that process, it occurred to me that we were making the same mistake. We were turning to our faith to respond to this horrific act of faith that had been foisted on us. And in that moment, it occurred to me that perhaps faith was one of the greatest threats that mankind faced today. Faced today. You see, we live our life with ideas. Ideas fall on a continuum between absolute truth and absolute faults. Ideas inform our lives. And it seems to me that those ideas that have the greatest amount of logical proof or material evidence should be the ones that inform our lives the most. You see, I think that's why we debate, because an idea gets put out there, and it's put through this process of vetting, and it's challenged. And those ideas that, that are justified by logical proof, material evidence, are the ones that are sustainable and are the ones that should be used. But faith sidesteps this accountability process. Faith says that there are some ideas that should not be vetted that way. And when pressed hard, faith cries blasphemy. Now the reality is that most folks don't do harm based on their faith-based ideas. But that's not where the real risk is, I believe. I believe the risk is that when there's a broad acceptance of an idea, in this case, a broad acceptance of the idea of faith, that it gives power to those who would use faith to harm others, deliberately or otherwise. Let me explain it this way. 22-month-old Michael Heelman was playing around in the backyard of his Pennsylvania home. He was uh, running around, stepped on a piece of glass, and cut his foot open. And love motivated his, mo his mother to call his father home. Love motivated his father to clean and bind the wound and comfort the little boy. A few hours passed and the bleeding continued. So once again, love motivated the parents to reach out for additional help. But faith motivated them to call Charles Reinert, the pastor of the Faith Tabernacle where they worshipped. And when he arrived, faith is what guided his hand as well. Specifically, 
a passage in the biblical book of James that reads this, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. So Michael's parents held him as the pastor completed his biblical ablutions, and more hours passed, and the little boy's condition deteriorated further. The parents laid the child on bed, and their prayers took on a more desperate tone as his breathing became shallow and his color turned ghostly white. Love etched the lines on the face of his parents, but faith bound them to their choice of care. And in the end, faith closed the eyes of little Michael forever. Nothing, not even the death of a child, can force faith into the arms of accountability. But that's not where the tragedy ended. In a horrific example of the point that I made earlier, that it is the broad acceptance of the idea of faith, when the people of Pennsylvania turned to the courts for justice, they came across this passage in their child abuse statute. If upon investigation the county agency determines that the child has not been provided needed medical or surgical care because of seriously held religious beliefs of the child's parents, the child shall not be deemed to be physically or mentally abused. Again, ancient wisdom. Now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three. And the greatest of these is love. My challenge to that wisdom, faith is not a virtue. But what of love? The British philosopher Bertrand Russell was asked late in his life, he was interviewed and he was asked what it was he would like to pass on, what he had learned, what he'd like to pass on to future generations. And his answer included these words. Two things I should like to say, one intellectual and one moral. The intellectual thing I should like to say, I should say anytime you are considering a matter, you should look only at the facts and make your conclusions. Never let yourself be diverted either by what you would like to believe or what you think would have beneficial social effect if it were believed. But look only and solely at the facts. That's the intellectual thing I should like to say. The moral thing I should say, I should say love is wise and hatred is foolish. Mr. Russell speaks of the morality of love. Is faith moral? I don't see how. At best, faith is a failed arbiter of truth. In rejecting accountability, faith allows immorality to slip in. Faith failed us on 9-11. And faith failed the fundamental test of morality in protecting the well-being of a defenseless child. So I mentioned earlier that this passage comes from 1 Corinthians 13. There's another passage in that, in that chapter that most of you are familiar with. Love is long-suffering and is kind. Love does not envy. It's not puffed up. Love isn't unseemly. It's not selfish. It's not easily provoked, and it doesn't dwell on evil thoughts. It doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing but it rejoices in the truth, ladies and gentlemen. Love bears and endures all things, and love never fails. When you leave here today, I'd like to leave you with this thought. Going forward, what matrix will you use to determine morality and truth in your life? Faith, hope, and love. Hope really doesn't address it. Faith, refusing accountability, I believe, fails it. So of these three, I would say that the only moral filter is love. Thank you very much.